All right, let's have some fun, oh, and hopefully this doesn't come out complicated. Keep telling, teacher. Today we'll be talking about the seven-headed dragon and ten-horned antichrist. This is going to be a really fun and interesting teaching, but I just want to let all the people know that this is going to be the most complicated that I taught. It wasn't the hardest that I studied, but it is the most complicated that I'll teach to make you understand. So I want you to follow along as best as you can, look at your verses, pay attention. That way I can show you through a logical process and with scripture with scripture why the seven heads will refer to these certain seven kings and kingdoms and these ten horns would be referring to these certain ten kings and their kingdoms. Revelation chapter 12 verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven head and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Now notice right here, we see here a seven-headed dragon. And this seven-headed dragon, what you're going to find out, so one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, what you're going to find out is this seven-headed dragon, the Bible specifically states it has seven crowns on his head, meaning that it's referring to kings, and their kingdoms. And that's plainly, uh, that's plainly seen when you look to Revelation 17. Go to Revelation chapter 17. And then you're going to look at verse 9 through 10, verses 9 through 10. So this seven-headed dragon, you're going to find out that he has uh, seven crowns on top of seven heads, which undoubtedly refer to seven kings and kingdoms. Look at verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, that seven heads, okay, what are they? Are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Verse 10 continues, and there are what? Seven kings. See that? Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. So there is no doubt that this is referring to seven kings and their kingdoms. Psalms chapter 74, verse 13 through 14. Psalms chapter 74, verse 13 through 14. So forgive me if I don't write all of these verses here. It's because I need so much room to list you out the seven kings and their kingdoms, as well as the ten kings and their kingdoms, etc. Okay, so once more, seven-headed dragon, seven crowns on top of his head. We looked at Revelation 12 and 17. It has to refer to kings and their kingdoms. Now, here's another thing. If this is referring to kings and their kingdoms, who are they? Well, there's no doubt it would have to refer to kings all the way from the past to future history. Why is that? Because this dragon with seven heads existed. That seven head existed all the way back at the beginning, even till the book of Psalms. See, Psalms chapter 74, verse 13. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads, see that, of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. Who's a dragon and Leviathan? Why, that's Satan, which I taught you at a different video, which I'm not going to go through, but that's Satan. So, if the, such a being with seven heads existed all the way back at the past, and it occurs even at the future, remember Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, which we looked at before? That is before he comes down on the earth. So this is before the tribulation. So there's no doubt these seven kings refer to all time, not just tribulation, but from the past to the future. Okay, now look at Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, verse 5, Luke chapter 4, verse 5. Another thing is this. These are going to have to refer how you're going to find these seven kings out from past to future. You're going to have to find out this way. They are going to have to be connected to Satan. So they'll have to be connected to Satan, that dragon, and they're going to be, have to be referring to a one world power. That's how you're going to find these kings. A one world empire and a one world, uh, and they have to be connected to Satan. Because at Revelation 17, these ten kings and their kingdoms, it's a one world kingdom and government, right? So it's going to have to be that kind of power and it has to be directly connected to Satan. In fact, what did Satan say? He even said, he even showed that throughout that whole time, 
when he was giving the kingdoms of the whole world, he can give it to whomsoever he will. See that? So throughout past time to now, if these certain kings got such power over all kinds of kingdoms in the world that it's almost one world, who is that given from? See, Satan. So we can guess then who these kings would have to be. Okay, look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 5. Jesus could have been the next one. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him unto him what? All the kingdoms of the world. See that? The whole world. One world. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me. Look at this part. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. See that? So he has been giving it. He can give it. Now we got to figure out who they are. All right. The first one. Look at Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. The first one is Nimrod. Nimrod. And the kingdom is Babylon. Babylon. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 10. How do you know he's the one preacher? Well, the reason why we know is that he's the first king. If we're going to go from past to future history, he's the first one who had the whole world as one. Right? The Bible says the whole world was one that time. See, he was the first one. He had the whole world as one in Shinar at Babel. Look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Look at this line. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. See that? Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He was such a king and a conqueror. Look at this line. Verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom. See that? Beginning of his kingdom was what? Babel. That's where Babylon came from, you understand. And Eric and Achad and Kalna, notice where? In the land of Shinar. Now look at chapter 11. The whole world was one in Shinar. See that? So Nimrod had control over the whole world. That makes sense why God scattered them. See that? Especially if you study the history of Nimrod. Look at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1 through 2. And the whole earth was one language and of one speech. And where was this whole earth? And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. See that? God couldn't have that. Nuh uh. All right, look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. Not only that, where does the seven where is the seven-headed dragon located? See that? So he's connected to Satan too. You notice that. Where is the seven-headed dragon located? Babylon. Revelation chapter 17. And look at verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having, there's that seven-headed dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. There's that seven-headed dragon. But where? Where is this happening? Verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery what? Babylon the Great. Okay, there's no doubt it has to be Nimrod. Now look at Ezekiel 29. Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3. The second head is Pharaoh. The second head is Pharaoh. The kingdom is Egypt. Pharaoh of Egypt. Look at Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's because Egypt during Moses' days was a powerful kingdom that was greater than most of the world. So we can fit that one in. But not only that, he's compared, Pharaoh's compared to Satan the dragon and Leviathan. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 3. Well, I didn't know that. That's right, because you haven't heard that in a Bible-believing church. You need to attend a Bible-believing church. Ask your pastor this, your local church pastor, who's not a Bible believer. Blow his mind up. Ezekiel 29 verse 3. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I am against thee, who? Pharaoh king of Egypt. What does he describe? The gray dragon. But look at this, verse 4. I, but I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause a fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales. 
put hooks in his jaws and he's at the river. The Leviathan, Job 41. Job chapter 41. Job 41. If you say Bible study is boring after this, I think you're not saved, I guess. I'll just say as one cr uh, dumb preacher said, you're a reprobate, you're a reprobate. You know, I might as well say that. I'm just joking, obviously. But look at Job chapter 41 and verse 1. Look at this. Canst thou draw out Leviathan, right? That's Satan with a what? Hook. Oh, boom. And, or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down. Canst thou put an hook into his nose or bore his notice jaw through with the thorn? That matches with Ezekiel. See that? See that? All right, the next one is Sennacherib. Look at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. The next one is Sennacherib of Assyria. Sennacherib of Assyria. But we're going to look at two of these heads here. Number four head, the number four head is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Let's look at these third and fourth heads and why they're the good candidate. Because notice what they're called. They're connected to Satan once more. Now look at Isaiah chapter 10. There is no doubt that Assyria during Sennacherib's days was a powerful kingdom that was greater than most of the world. In fact it was greater than Egypt and Babylon. That was how powerful it was during Sennacherib's day. That's why he's the best candidate for it, for his kingdom. And then Nebuchadnezzar, there's no doubt he's head number four. Why? Because head number four, Babylon, eventually conquered Assyria. And Babylon became uh, the world empire that time. It became the most powerful kingdom that later replaced Assyria. So let's look at head number three and four. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12. Isaiah's writing, who was king of Assyria during Isaiah's time? It was Sennacherib. Now watch this. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of who? Assyria. So that's Sennacherib then. And the glory of his high looks. Okay, the king of Assyria is described as a fruit, as a tree. Now look at this. This is carried on into the tribulation time period of this Assyrian king persecuting the Jews, but God will regather the Jews at the future tribulation and restore them. Why? Who is this king who would persecute the Jews at the tribulation then, and God restores them? The Antichrist. So that's why the Antichrist, he is known as an Assyrian, and Sennacherib is connected to Satan. See that? Now let's look. If you don't believe me, let's keep reading right here. Look at verse 19. And the rest of the trees, right, of Assyria, the Assyrian king, his trees, right, of his forest shall be few, that a child may write them. So his tree is judged. But look, Israel is restored. Verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them. Right? Speaking of that Assyrian king who smote them. But shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Now think about it. Did that happen in Sennacherib's day where the children of Israel where they got they fully returned to the Lord and they stayed upon him and they were regathered? No. If you're going to get the closest to that, that is long after Nebuchadnezzar Babylon. So this is carrying through prophecy from Sennacherib to the Antichrist. See that? Okay, let's look at Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah 51, verse 34. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34. You'd be surprised how many kings in the Bible, were compared to Satan. Why? Because Satan is the power of the kingdoms, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. See that? So Satan is the king, but Satan within those kings is ruling over those kingdoms. Woo! And this just brings up as a side note that Jesus Christ is in you, so that's why you are ambassadors for Jesus Christ 
reigning over the kingdom of God, and you will have the body of Jesus Christ himself and literally ruling on the kingdom Amen. on the earth. Woo! That's wild, man. All right. Look at Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34. Man, the Bible is fun, isn't it? Amen. Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. So we're looking at verse 34 of Jeremiah 51. He devoured me, crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a who? Dragon. Dragon. But ooh, 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 guess what? Sennacherib's compared to the same thing. Look at chapter 50, verse 17. Chapter 50, verse 17. Really, preacher? Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar is a devouring, right? He devoured the Jews, right? Like a dragon. Sennacherib followed the same action of devouring the Jews, and he's mentioned within the same context as Nebuchadnezzar. Look at Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 17. The Word of God reads right here. Let me, oh, my hands are slippery. Let me turn this page. Here we are. Israel is a scattered sheep, right, being judged. The lions have driven them away. First, who? The king of Assyria hath what? devoured him. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar devoured the Jews like a dragon. But look who's in context here. And last, this what? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. So see, Sennacherib is also likened in the same context with Nebuchadnezzar as a devouring dragon. Thus, three and four, we got it. There's no doubt. Now let's look at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. The next head is Darius or Cyrus? Darius or Cyrus of Median Persia. Media Persia. That's the kingdom. There is no doubt when you study history who was the next most powerful kingdom that replaced Babylon. It was Media Persia. But not only that, we see that as check marking on this one, but it check marks on this one too. Why? Because what is Satan's title? Look at Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. This ain't no regular king of Persia. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, see that? Is that a regular one? No. Withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Look at that. Michael the archangel had to intervene. So this is a spiritual being. That is Satan. It, by the way, isn't Michael the archangel battling one of the seven-headed dragon at Revelation 12? Woo! 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 You might want to increase the views on this video Come and on. just play repeat, repeat, and share it. Like and share, like and share. Now look at uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. If that ain't enough to blow up your mind, okay? We're coming now to Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. He undoubtedly was a powerful king conquering worlds. Conquering worlds and the Grecian Empire was the next most powerful empire that replaced Persia. That's proven throughout history. And then I'll put Greece here. I'm not sure if people can read that online, but Greece. Within the same chapter where he said, Prince of Persia, who follows along? Look at Daniel chapter 10, and we will look at verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I will come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with who? The Prince of Persia. Who is that Prince of Persia? Remember, Satan, right? Now look who's coming after this guy. And when I am gone forth, lo, the who? Prince of Grecia shall come. Did you read that before in your Bible? Wow, isn't that amazing? Well, Pastor, I don't know about that. Oh, let me blow up your mind even more. Go to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Who does the Antichrist come from? He comes from the Prince of Grecia. Because he comes from Syria, from one of the splits of Prince of Grecia. Ha, 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 ha. Look at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. Isn't that book just blows up your mind every single time? Daniel chapter 8, verse 21. And the rough goat is the who? King of Grecia. 
Now, look who comes out, out of this guy. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, that being broken, okay, so that great horn, which is the king of Grisha, it breaks up and it splits into four parts. Whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. See that? So it comes from the prince of Grisha. But throughout these four splits, look who eventually comes out of this branch. And in the latter time, what latter time? What does the Bible say about latter days, etc.? Tribulation, right? But keep reading. Latter time of who? Their kingdom. See, coming from that Grecian kingdom. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king, who is this king? A fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That's the Antichrist. How do you know? Read verse 25. And through his policy, we're waiting for that policy one day <laughs> at Israel. Through his policy also sh he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. That's definitely the Antichrist. But if you're not convinced, he shall also stand up against the who? Prince of princes. That's Antichrist. That's Satan incarnate. All right, now we're at horn number seven. Horn number seven. Look, the horn number seven is Caesar Augustus. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Caesar Augustus. The empire is Rome. There's no doubt because, I don't know if you know this, he is the first emperor of the United Roman Empire. And during that time, it was extremely powerful. And Rome, if you know your history, was the next world empire that took over after Greece fell. But not only that, do you know who Caesar is likened to, the Roman emperor is likened to in the Bible? The Antichrist. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Chapter 2. You have to believe in the doctrine of the kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of God. Right. See that? That's because there is no doubt there is a physical kingdom God was using that time. And a spiritual kingdom he was working. And Satan has his own physical kingdom as well as the spiritual kingdom. There is absolutely no doubt about that. It makes me laugh that some of these pastors who have the audacity to call themselves, We're the brand new IFB. Ha, 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 because I'm smarter than you. But they're too dumb to figure this stuff out. And they say, this is just like a maze. And it just sounds so interesting and ooh, fascinates you. But they just go into abstract stuff. Way out in La La Land. No, it's see, it shows that they're so dumb they can't see that book. Amen. See that? Now, I'm not bashing pastors out there or Christians who don't know this stuff. That's why I stress about attending a Bible-believing church, going under a Bible-believing pastor. But I am bashing certain heretics and pastors out there who deny dispensationalism yeah. and say, well, this doesn't make sense. Like that. So look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we will read verse 3. Look at this. The Antichrist, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Antichrist, right? But look, this man of sin, his power, the Antichrist, was already occurring in Paul's time. Because look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth what? already work see that only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way the unofficial version of the antichrist roman king was already underway then the official antichrist roman king will come out in verse 8 and then shall that wicked capitalized antichrist be revealed see that see there's an unofficial antichrist there's no doubt going before this official Antichrist. See how I'm doing logically scripture with scripture and very clearly, see? So there's no doubt, this is not abstract. This is not, ooh, just catching interesting things and connecting the dots and going like that. No, I'm showing you clearly from scripture. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse one. Revelation chapter 13, verse one. Boy, wow, that was something. But, hey, guess what? We're not done. Now let's talk about the ten horns, what they are. Let's look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Now we got another question here. There's this uh, 
seven-headed animal that comes out, but this one comes out like a leopard. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> but he comes out like a leopard, the Bible says. And what's really interesting about this particular creature is that it is so similar with this one, but it is different. How so? Because it's a leopard one. And not only that, it doesn't have seven crowns on seven heads. It's ten crowns on its ten horns. Three, four, five, six, seven. The dragon also had ten horns, right? But the Bible said the crowns were on his head, not on his horns. So that's seven, and then eight, nine, ten. And then we'll put right here eight, nine, ten. And the crown goes directly on the horns. So each horn, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. All right, now we got to figure out who these kings are, right? That's what we got to figure out now. Who are these kings? Look at Revelation chapter 13. And we will read verse 1 through 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That's this beast that I drew out. Having seven heads and ten horns. And, <clears throat> and upon his horns, what? Ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. Now, how we can figure out automatically the seven kings in these horns, how we can automatically figure that out is this. Is that... You go through four logical steps. One, the dragon's power of one world kingdoms is given to the beast, see, which means the beast has the same one world kingdom power of the seven heads and ten horns like the dragon does. It's the same thing. How do you know that, preacher? Just keep reading. Verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. So that proves it's different from this creature. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And who? The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. No wonder, there's no doubt, Luke 4, I can give it to whomsoever I will. And that, no wonder these people had the title of Satan and the Antichrist, Satan incarnate. It all makes sense. Yeah. Dispensationalism makes sense. It's not something crazy. It goes long, la line. It makes more sense now why the word exactly said it that way, okay? Now, here's another thing. Let's go to logic step number two now, where we can figure this out. The beast's ten horns has crowns on them, right? Chapter 13, verse 1. Mm -hmm. So that follows the same step as this one. So if these represent seven kings, okay, the crowns on top, then that means this would represent ten kings on top. Oh, you're making that up. Go to chapter 17 and verse 12. Chapter 17 and verse 12. Come on now. Come on. Don't be a Bible amateur, okay? And keep accusing us for making wild interpretations. Go to chapter 17, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are what? Okay, there's your answer, okay? So the crown on top of the horn should obviously indicate anyways it's a king and a kingdom but if that doesn't convince you the verse plainly said that okay now let's look at daniel chapter 8 daniel chapter 8 let's go to logic step number three where we can figure this out okay so there's no doubt then here's something interesting the horn comes from the head right i mean the horn grows from the head right if that's the case that means the head will have the same kingdom as the horn. That's how you can figure out seven of these. See that? Because if the horn comes out of the head, we already know what the seven heads are, right? It's these. But if the horn comes out of the head, then that means it's going to share these kings and kingdoms. So we already got seven of the horns. Oh, you just made that up. You just made that up. One, it's common sense. The horn comes out of the head. Two, the scripture shows it. Look at Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 8. Did you forget what we just read about this one? Daniel 8 verse 20. Chapter 8 verse 20. The ram which thou sawest, having what? Two horns. See that? Are the kings of what? Media Persia. 
That's why we can figure that this ram animal, this head, is Media Persia. And then the horns that come out of it, see that? But keep reading. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now look at this. Several horns come out of this head, right? Yeah. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up, four, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, you know that's the Antichrist. This is all connected to Greece. Mm -hmm. See that? So all these different horns that come out, yep. they're all connected to the same kingdom. So here's the idea. The idea is this. You do know that the, the horns are different kingdoms from each other, but they come from the same root kingdom. Yeah. Now, let me repeat that for some of you anti-dispensationalists out there who just got lost and say, well, well that's just weird. That's just weird. Oh. You're weird, okay? I think people already got the memo, but let me repeat just in case. Here's the thing. Horns have different kingdoms from each other. But when they come from the same head, they came from the same root kingdom. Yeah. That's why it makes sense at Daniel 8.20, it's the same empire, Media, Persia. But it's got two horns. Media is not the same as Persia. Amen. Okay? Kapshe. Okay, you get it? All right, now let's look at this next logic. Praise the Lord, I'm a Bible-believing, dispensational, King James-only person. Amen. If I wasn't that way, I, we wouldn't know these kind of doctrines. <laughs> amen. I, man, I, man. Amen. By the way, I didn't make this up. There are Bible-believing teachers and pastors who already know this kind of stuff. Amen. I'm just teaching you online so that you can enjoy the fruit with us. Amen. Some of you anti-dispensationalists who don't want to enjoy the fruit, that's fine. You can keep critiquing through the video. The rest of you sit back and keep watching and eat your fruit and enjoy it, bless God. All right, now the next, so we already got the seven horns then. There's no doubt, see that? So let's go through the seven horns uh, right here. It's going to be Nimrod, Babylon. Now I'm gonna waste so much time writing all of this out, so I'll just abbreviate, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Then we gotta figure out eight, and then, um, well, I'll put 9 here and then 10 here. Okay, let's put a dividing line over here. That way we don't get really lost. Rightly divide. Rightly divide, amen. All right, so we know who these are. Okay, they're going to be Pharaoh of Egypt. They're going to be Sennacherib of Assyria. There's going to be Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Then we're going to have uh, Darius or Cyrus of Media Persia. And then we have Alexander the Great of Greece. Then we have Caesar Augustus of Rome. Now we got to figure out 8, 9, and 10, right? Mm -hmm. Now this is where it gets really fun now, okay? This is really fun, okay? Here's the thing, okay? Remember I mentioned to you the horns have d different kingdoms from each other, but they come from the same root kingdom, if from the same head? Mm -hmm. Why is it only seven heads, not ten heads? Because, okay, now... That's why I drew it out. If you're not going to get it unless you picture it out. We know what one horn per head is, right? Now think about it. That's just seven horns. In order to make a ten, we have to add one here in the same head, add one here in the same head, and add one here in the same head. So then these three are going to have to be separate kingdoms from each other. And they're going to have to come from the same root kingdom. That's how we're going to figure it out. Well, how are we going to figure that out, Pastor? Oh, my, my friend. Daniel and Revelation are companions. Go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. You have to believe rightly dividing. You have to believe rightly dividing. Daniel and Revelation are companions. Daniel, prophecy for Old Testament. And Revelation, prophecy for New Testament. Rightly dividing, and you connect the dots, and it just comes out beautifully, and you get all the answers. Amen. All right, now, here's the thing. So we got to figure out, then, what these three kings are that is from the same root kingdom, but they are diverse from their neighbor horns, okay? We have to figure that out. It's going to be easier than you think. 
Look at Daniel chapter 7. Well, I don't, it sounds pretty hard. No, it'll be easy. Look at Daniel 7. And we'll look at verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Okay, there's a lion with eagle's wings. Verse 5, here's the second beast. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and raised up itself on one side. Look at verse 6. And I be, and this after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard. So here's the third beast, a leopard. Look at verse 7, the fourth beast. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Look at this part. And it was diverse from all the beasts uh, that were before it, and it had ten horns. Okay, the three beasts, bear, lion, leopard, this fourth beast, whoever he is, he's a diversity of these three. He has ten horns. Who is that? Did you remember Revelation? Now, keep your hand, Daniel 7, and keep your hand, Revelation 13, because we're going to be rightly dividing here. Now, go to, keep your hand in those two places. We're going to go through this over and over again. That way, we can figure out who those kingdoms are. Look at Revelation 13. Now, keep your hand, Daniel 7, Revelation 13. That's the Antichrist. Well, how do you know that? Well, look at Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. That matches with what? Daniel chapter 7 and uh, verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea. See that? Okay. Let's keep go to Revelation 13 again. And look at verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a what? Leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a what? Bear and his mouth as the mouth of a what? Lion. Oh, did you remember? Daniel 7, verse 3 through 7. Lion, bear, and leopard. And this fourth beast, whoever he is, is a diversity of lion, bear, and leopard. We already know what that is. That's the Antichrist at Revelation 13, too. This seven-headed monster. Now, let's keep reading. Uh, if that's not enough, this should be convincing enough, but what should convince you is Daniel 7, verse 7. It said this fourth beast had ten horns, right? Revelation 13, 1. This beast that comes out has how many horns? Ten horns. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. This is not abstract. This is no doubt. This is the monster Daniel was referring to and John saw. Okay, now, here's the idea. Now go back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. So, then we do know this. This beast has to come from lion, bear, and leopard, right? He has to consist of those three beasts, correct? Why? Because Revelation 13, Daniel 7 says so. So he has to refer to these three, and we know these three are referring to some kind of kingdoms. That fills in the gap here of these three leftovers, right? All right, but we got to figure it out now, okay? First, look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now, Belshazzar was the last king, correct, of Babylon. Who follows after Babylon? Now look at verse 17. Verse 17. So it's not Babylon. It's something after Babylon. Now look at verse 17. These great beasts, referring to those four beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall what? Arise, Arise out of the earth. These kings are referring to the ones that's after Babylon. Okay? Now if you remember the image of Nebuchadnezzar, what are the four kingdoms that Daniel, or five, the five kingdoms that Daniel always talks about the whole book? It's Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and Antichrist, right? That is absolutely no doubt. That's not abstract. That's absolutely no doubt in the whole book of Daniel. This kingdom, continuing that context of those five things, it can't be Babylon. Why? Because verse 1 and the verse 17, it's a kingdom that's after Belshazzar, who's the last king of Babylon. 
So that would be what? Persia, Greece, and Rome. You got it here. And then Antichrist, the fourth beast. That makes sense. See that? So that makes sense now. So we figured out who they are. Lion is Persia. Bear, uh, media Persia. Bear is Greece. Leopard is Rome. And then fourth is Antichrist. That's why it's four, not five. See that in Daniel? It makes sense. But here's the thing here. The thing is, is that uh, we see that throughout historically in the Bible that the ancient kingdoms of lion, bear, and leopard no longer exist. Why? Because remember, the fourth beast, when he comes out, he comes with the power of lion, power of bear, power of leopard. It's not accurate to say that when this beast comes out with this three diversity, he comes out with the ancient kingdom of Darius Cyrus, ancient kingdom of Alexander, ancient kingdom of Caesar. It's talking about a modern kingdom of that time. See, so we obviously have to be a modern kingdom. Now, remember, these horns that come out comes from the same root kingdom, so Persia, Greece, and Rome, but it's going to be different. That makes sense then, see, that these three leftover horns is going to be from the same root kingdom, but different. Not only that, didn't you already read Daniel 8, it, this king that comes out in the future he comes from ancient greece but obviously he comes in modern form the antichrist right this beast comes out leopard lion and bear in modern times obviously these ancient kingdoms don't exist so these will have to transition to a modern kingdom just like daniel 8 does in other chapters of daniel where it talks about an ancient kingdom that transitions into something else in modern form so we got to figure out who these modern kingdoms are see well that's where it gets interesting look at revelation 13 verse 2 revelation 13 verse 2 now keep your hand at those two chapters now keep your hand at those two chapters because we're going to figure out who these modern kingdoms are so think about today's time period today's modern age who would be the proper modern kingdoms that would fit persia media persia greece and rome who would be the proper ones right so let's figure this out we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. Beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as a mouth of a what? Lion. This beast that comes out has the mouth of a lion. Mouth of a lion. Think about this. The ant what is the best language for the Antichrist to use in order to rule the whole world? English. So England would be the perfect candidate. Oh, I don't know. Well, first one, it's language, yeah. mouth of a lion. Yeah. But number two, London's coat of arms has a griffin. Look at Daniel 7, 4. What is this lion? Daniel 7, 4. What is a griffin? It's a lion's body with eagle's wing. And what did Daniel chapter 7, verse 4 say? The first was like a lion and had what? Oh! If that's not enough, here's another thing. The only two nations, only two nations that restored the nation of Israel was Media, Persia, and England with its Balfour Declaration. Oh, okay, now, there's no doubt, England. This is not abstract. This is not abstract, okay? There's no doubt. Okay, anyways, let's figure out the bear now, right? Let's figure out the bear. Look at Revelation 13, verse 2. The Bible gave you all the clues. All the clues. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. Well, I don't know why it's his mouth of a lion, feet of a bear, and blah, blah, blah. It just puts it out there. No, trust me, there's a reason for it, okay? The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the what? Feet of a bear. It's bear's feet. The best candidate for the bear is Russia. Why? Because its feet moves to arise and devour many nations, to which contributed the saying. I don't know if you heard of this saying. Russia's political power has a saying, the bear who walks like a man. Look at Daniel chapter 7. Look at Daniel 7 and verse 5. Behold another beast, a second like to a bear, 
Look at this, and it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, see its feet getting ready. Arise, devour much flesh. This kingdom has to be something that devours and conquers and eats up many nations. Russia is definitely the best candidate with that kind of saying, the bear who walks like a man. You had communism at the Soviet Union, China, North Korea, Vietnam, Cuba. It always had constant, batter, constant power battles of technology and reaching so-called outer space. And then even today, you're getting a lot of power struggle in politics with Russia and the world, right? See that? There is no doubt. But if that's not enough to convince you, Russia's famous symbol ever since communist Soviet Union, and even today, you know what it is? It's the bear. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's the bear. By the way, this definitely matches with Greece. Why? Who is the nation? Aha, aha. He arise and devoured much flesh, conquering and conquer. Russia matches with that. And by the way, here's another interesting thing. Russia continued the power of Greece through its Greek Orthodox religion. Now, I also, now, I don't know if this part is true, but I heard Russian alphabet or language came from Greece. Oh, oh, okay, there's no doubt. Okay, now, see, it makes sense. These horns are diverse from its neighbor, but from the same root. Now look at uh, Revelation 13, verse 2. Who's the leopard? This country definitely has no doubt. Every prophecy scholar would agree this country, this nation has to play in prophecy. What do you think that country is? The United States of America. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Look at that. Its whole body, its main body is a leopard. Who is the main body? Think about the main body, the main country that does all of the world access today. The United States of America. But not only that, think about, uh, think about this. The Antichrist, he has to use the main body of a leopard for his one world ruling, right? What other country would be the best candidate for that as a main body? It has to be America. America would be the best thing as a main body. It's diverse. Oh, by the way, the beast was diverse from its diversity, right, from others. It's diverse. America's diverse. It's powerful in education, in business. It has a lot of uh, connection with politics and nation. It's America, America, and America. But not only that, think about it. The leopards, three colors, it matches with the three racial colors of sociology. The yellow body of a leopard matches with Shem, the mongoloid race. The black spots of a leopard matches with Ham, the negroid race. And the white belly of the leopard matches with Japheth, the Caucasian race. And that is a fact in sociology. They literally named those three. And coincidentally, its colors, its national colors matches with, its ethnicity colors matches with the leopard. The leopard is a melting pot. Uh -huh. You see that? So there is clearly no doubt that it has to be America. That would be the best candidate. And by the way, how it matches with Rome is this. How it matches with Rome is what is the empire that conquered most of the world, but not only that, through mystery, spiritual form, mm -hmm. went throughout all the nations. It's not just America who has access. What religion? And I'm talking about religion, the number one religion, and I mean number one religion, who has the most powerful access throughout all countries, the Roman Catholic Church. It ain't Islam. It's fastest growing religion, but it's in certain regions. Yeah. It's the Catholic Church. It's in everywhere, in politics, in elites, mm -hmm. in powers, in Illuminati, in uh, ecumenical movement, in your modern version translation. It's Rome. Mm -hmm. It's Rome. Oh, that is something right there, man. Yeah. All right. Now let's look back at Daniel 7. Now we're going to close. Let's close this off. All right. Now we figured out who's number eight. Number eight is England. Number nine is Russia. 
Number 10. America, America, God will not shed his grace on thee when Revelation 13 happens. All right, now let's look at Daniel chapter 7 and then da Revelation 17 as well. Revelation 17. There's two confusing passages that we got to solve now. We're not done. We're not done. This is not the exact setup, actually. You might say, I thought it was. No. Because there are two confusing passages now. But actually the confusion just brings up more brilliance and more reconciliation and an interesting doctrine that the Lord showed you. So I'm going to show you, okay? There are two confusing passages with this. The first one is this. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7. Here's the first one. Look at verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, notice right here, among three horns, there is one little horn that pops up and replaces these three horns. Hmm, I wonder what that is. Well, who would that be, Pastor? Well, the thing is this, is that this little horn, we know who this little horn is. Look at verse 9. It's the Antichrist, see? God comes down and wipes out that little horn, the Ancient of Days. That little horn is the Antichrist. But not only that, look at verse 8. This little horn, mouth speaking great things, right? Mm -hmm. Did you remember Revelation 13, that Antichrist? Mouth speaking what? Great things, blasphemy. So this is the Antichrist. This Antichrist takes over the other three horns. Who are they? It's not a brainer if you think about it. What is the only kingdom that will exist when the Antichrist comes out? The only three. Boom, boom, and boom. Not only that, isn't the Antichrist a diversity of these three? So when this Antichrist comes out, what happens? He knocks over these three powers and sets up his own kingdom. See that? He's a diversity of those three main powerhouses. Now let's look at uh, Revelation, uh, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Uh, so we already saw that. Now let's look at verse 20, verse 20. And of the ten horns that were in his head, right? Remember the ten horns? And of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, right? Three horns knocked out. And even of that horn that had eyes, that little horn, replaces the three horns. And a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Right? Now look at verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Right? He replaces those three kings. That's why, keep your hand, Daniel 7. We're going to go back. Look at Revelation 17, right? Oh, it makes sense now when you read verse 11. Re Revelation 17, verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. How does he become the eighth horn? Because he knocks off three and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Why does he become eight? Because think about this. If you knock off these three horns, it becomes seven, right? But this little horn pops out, he becomes how many horns now? Isn't that book amazing? Yes, All right, now let's look at uh, Revelation 17, verse 11. Now here's the second confusing passage, okay? Man, don't underestimate every single word That's in the right. King James Bible. Amen. That's why you have to be King James Bible believer, and you have to be dispensational so that you can find these golden nuggets. Amen. Now let's look at verse 11. This is a problem. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the what? Seven. So here's something that's confusing now. We get that he's the eighth, but how does he become the seven? We already have seven here. See that? So how does he become the seven? Just be an atheist and just be an anti-dispensationalist. Oh, you're just making things up and this is just so weird, bizarre. It's not going to fit. No, if you study... It's going to be even more amazing. That's what happens. 
I get excited when there's a contradiction in the Bible, so called <laughs> contradiction. You know why? Through the lens of dispensationalism, you can find something even more amazing. All right, now, I'm going to give you another confusing thing. Okay, if you thought that was confusing enough, how you can fit number seven, here's something even worse that's more confusing. So we're going to prove that your Bible has errors, right? Let's do this. Look at verse 10. So here's a problem. Uh, we're going to look at verse 10. The Bible says right here, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen. Okay. One through five is already gone. So that would be up to uh, Darius. Look at this part. And one is. Now, John is presently writing at that time, right? He's saying right here, one is. What? Alexander the Great is current at John's time? That doesn't make sense. Here's another one. Let's keep reading. And, uh, and the other is not yet come. Number seven is not yet here. What? Future? That doesn't make sense. Oops, this is out of the boundary so people won't see that. This is future. What are you talking about? This is the current one, right? So there must be an error. At last, we found an error. We found an error. Nope. nope, it just gets more amazing. Here's the thing right here. If you look at the seven horns, remember, seven kings and kingdoms, right? That's what it is, right? Do you see a kingdom mentioned twice here? Uh-huh, see that? It's got to be kings and kingdoms, see that? So the thing is this is that it will make sense if we knock this guy out. So we knock this guy out, combine him here, it's going to be Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, see? Because of Babylon, see? You can't have two Babylons during the tri uh, tribulation time period, see? So the thing is this, when these ten kings come out, so here's the devil reviving all these empires, and then he comes out as a conglomerate, but the thing is, it doesn't make sense when you have like two like that. So we cross this guy out, and it would make sense why Nebuchadnezzar was no connected to Satan and Nimrod connected to Satan. These two connected to one world empires. Why? Because Babylon is so. See, So it makes perfect sense why the Lord did these two. All right. So now we got here one, two, three. This one will be four. This one will be five. And thus, what? Five kings are fallen. See that? One is. So this is not future. This is present tense. And one is to come, the Antichrist. So, yep, I told you I wasn't going to have any room. So let's just put seven here. Seven, Antichrist. That's why he is what? Of the seven, and he becometh the what? He becometh the eighth. Why? Because this eighth will eventually swallow up these three, and that's why it makes sense when you look at Revelation 17.11. This is interesting. Revelation 17.11. That's why it would make sense if you have two parts of the tribulation. The Antichrist comes out as number seven, then he goes into perdition at the middle of the tribulation. Then the latter half, he swallows up and becomes number eight. Uh, I don't know. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Look at this. Look at this. This is so amazing. Look at Revelation 17, verse 11. And the beast that was, see that? Back at the past, he was ruling before and is not. He's currently not there. Why? Because he's dead. He got assassinated. Even he is the eighth. He becomes the eighth. Why? And is of the seven. He was originally seven. Why? Boom. Look at this. What does it say? Go and into goeth into perdition. And when he comes out of perdition, that's why 2 Thessalonians 2 says he is the son of perdition. Yep. He comes out of perdition. How long does that last? Three and a half oh, years. Oh, Revelation 13. By the way, your King James Bible just doesn't say three and a half. It says he continues his Ooh. continues three and a half. Ah, this is great. You just want to run the aisles after this. That book is amazing. Revelation 13. Verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. 
And all the world wondered after the beast. There it goes, see, number seven, right? Got wounded. He got injured. He's out of the picture. But guess what? He comes out. Verse 3, it says it was healed. See, he comes out again. Verse 4, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast. Remember 2 Thessalonians 2, if you're familiar with that chapter? He's called son of perdition, and he's worshiped, exalted above that is God. Saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's three and a half years. Now let's close our Bibles and dismiss with a word of prayer. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're not a King James only Bible believer, if you're not a dispensationalist, now would be a good time, bless God. Amen. Come on. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.